Hello, good evening, everybody. Welcome to another wonderful program in the CCA living room. My name is Amara Nash. I'm the Associate Director of Operations here at CCA. And we are so happy to be partnering with Collected Works on this wonderful program this evening. We love our local bookstores and encourage you to support them um, as often as you can. I will be putting in the chat once we get started information about how you can order the book that is the topic of our wonderful um, program tonight. Um, just a quick rundown of events. Uh, Betty Kearse is going to be giving an introduction of her book and her wonderful story. Then we together will be watching um, a short documentary made by Eduardo Montes Bradley featuring Christian Coates. And then we're going to follow that with a discussion um, with all three of those people moderated by the wonderful Pamela Herndon. We will invite you to ask questions during that um, period um, using the Q&A tool at the bottom of your screen. That really is preferable to the chat if you can remember. Also, you can upvote other people's questions. If someone has something that you think is really interesting, you can move it up to the top of the list because we might not be able to get to everybody's, but we'll try. Um, with that, I would like to introduce Pamela. She serves as the president and CEO of the KWH Law Center for Social Justice and Change. This nonprofit law center provides access to justice for low and medium income individuals and advocates for the rights of women, children, and families with children. In addition, she's the first vice president of the Albuquerque branch of the NAACP. She occasionally hosts the weekly KUNM radio gospel music program, Train to Glory, and serves as the vice president of the board of directors of the African American Performing Arts Center in Albuquerque, which is the only African American performing arts center in the Southwest. She is a 2019 to 21 WK Kellogg Fellow. And wow, we sure are honored to have her here with us tonight. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to you, Pamela. Thank you so much. Thank you, Amira. It is absolutely wonderful to be here this evening. I can think of no better place to spend a Tuesday evening than right here on the virtual platform from the Center for Contemporary Arts in Santa Fe. Tonight, you will meet an esteemed group of panelists who will discuss the other Madisons, the lost history of a president's black family. First, let's meet the writer, filmmaker who has received national and international recognition for his portraiture of the enslaved descendants of the men and women who worked, lived, and died at James Madison's Mount Pelier. His work has a strong presence in film festivals, public television, and in academic libraries. He is the documentarian who captured on film the story of the other Madisons, the lost history of the president's black family. He is none other than the one and only Eduardo Montez Bradley. You will also see this excitement continue to grow this evening as you meet the man who serves as the CEO of the First Amendment Museum in Augusta, Maine. He spent nearly two decades working at James Madison's Mount Pillar where he provides enhanced education experiences for visitors to this historical location. He, is, he also provides the context for interpretation for people who visit. And he is always at the forefront of working with descendants and relatives at Mount Pelier. He is the one and the only Christian Coates. And your evening reaches the apex of enjoyment knowledge and history as you meet and hear from the award-winning author of The Other Madisons, The Lost History of the President's Black Family. He is a, she is a retired pediatrician who decided to move to Santa Fe approximately three years ago so that we could meet her up close and personal. 
Now, let me just tell you this. According to her family's oral history, she is the, a descendant of the enslaved cook Corrine and Corrine's enslaver and half-brother, President James Madison. She has earned an international Afro-American Historical and Genealogical Society Book Award for nonfiction, and her book is listed by the Smithsonian Magazine as one of the top 10 best history books of 2020. Let's all get the excitement going because you are now ready to meet the one, the only, Dr. Betty Pierce. It's a pleasure to see you and to have you with us tonight. Thank you, Pamela. That was such a wonderful, energizing introduction. I am an American griot, which is spelled G-R-I-O-T-T-E, a female griot, which is spelled G-R-I-O-T. Griots and griots are oral historians in the ancient West African tradition. For thousands of years, Generations of these men and women who have amazing memories have spoken the stories of their ancestors and the history of their people. This tradition remains alive in Africa and having survived nearly two centuries of voyages to America through the Middle Passage, it remains alive in many African-American homes today. Without this tradition, um, as Pamela said, I would not know that I am a descendant of the enslaved cook Corrine and her enslaver and half-brother, President James Madison. I grew up hearing and reciting and trying to live up to my family's 200 year old credo, always remember, you're a Madison, you come from African slaves and a president. For most of us, the credo is a source of inspiration and pride. The credo began six generations before I was born. Dolly Madison had just sold her husband's and Corrine's teenage son, my great, great, great grandfather, Jim. As he was being taken away, Corrine pleaded with Jim, always remember, you're a Madison. She believed the name could help them find each other someday, but they never saw each other again. Yet Jim remembered his mother's words and passed them on to his children and told them to tell their children and their children's children that they were Madisons. Over the generations, as America changed, words were added and the credo became what it is today. In 1990, when my mother, my family's seventh generation griot, turned over to me the old cardboard box of family memorabilia. I became the eighth generation griot. When I asked her, why now? She answered in her slight Texan drawl, I want to give you plenty of time to write the book. I was a pediatrician, but my mother knew I loved to write. Her intent was for me to write down the stories in order to preserve them. She recognized that as what our ancestors endured during slavery and what her grandfather and her father and she herself had endured during Jim Crow. As, the, as those time periods became part of the distant past, our family would become comfortable with their lives. 
and forget our history. She also felt that now was the time for our family's story to become part of America's story. But for many years, I had wondered why or even whether the pre credo should make me proud. For me, it resounded with the abuses of slavery. I decided that to become a griot who understands and had reconciled all of the credo is saying, and a writer who tells the whole story, I would confront its discomforting parts. So in 1992, I began my journey of discovery of my ancestors, our country, and myself. I traveled to Lagos, Portugal, where the transatlantic slave trade began, to Ghana, West Africa, where my family's first African ancestor in America and our first griot was born, to Baltimore, Maryland, where a replica of a slave ship sits in a museum, to New York City, where an 18th century African burial ground had recently been discovered, and many, many times to Montpelier, James Madison's former plantation in Virginia, where three generations of my family had been enslaved. My travels taught me that wherever African slaves once walked, history had buried their footsteps. At the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean, as slave ships sailed along, under a gaudy concession stand in Portugal, beneath a federal building near Wall Street, among the ashes of burned documents and personal papers in courthouses and in private homes, and below a brick walkway and in unmarked graves at Montpelier. My ancestors and those of other African Americans I came to realize are best remembered not in carefully recorded names, dates, and places, not in letters, documents, and photographs kept in old cardboard boxes, not even in the family stories told from generation to generation. Our ancestors are best remembered in everything we do with the qualities we inherited from the men and women who came before us. The list of who we are and how we represent these astounding people is long and the possibilities are infinite because we all have talents and strengths passed down to us from our ancestors held in bondage. I believe that through the book I have written, I found a way to make the world pay attention to the enslaved people who helped build this country and to their legacies. The other Madisons, the lost history of a president's black family was published a year ago. And the paperback edition came out today. In the 30 years it took to write the other Madisons, I became a griot who will not let her footsteps be buried. And I discovered that it is the words, you come from African slaves in my family's credo that make me proud. I met filmmaker Eduardo Montes Bradley at Montpelier. And him, when he read my book, he sent me an email asking me if I wanted to make a movie. I'm glad I said yes. Eduardo's film uh, you're about to see 
is a wonderful extension of my book, reminding us that William Faulkner was correct when he wrote, the past is never dead. It's not even past. The first horn lifts its arm over the dew-lit grass, and in the slave quarters there is a rustling. Children are bundled into aprons, cornbread and water gourds grabbed, a salt pork breakfast taken. I watch them driven into the vague before dawn while their mistress sleeps like an ivory toothpick and Massa dreams of asses, rum, and slave funk. I cannot fall asleep again. At the second horn, the whip curls across the backs of the laggards, sometimes my sister's voice, unmistaken, among them. Oh, pray, she cries, oh, pray. Those days I lie on my cot, shivering in the early heat, and as the fields unfold to whiteness and they spill like bees among the fat flowers, I weep, it is not yet daylight. Well, there's a, quite a story about my family, where they came from. And actually, we did not start out in Oakland. And my family started out in Ghana, West Africa, if we want to go back to the first um, of our ancestors in this country. And her name was Mandy. And Mandy was a young woman when she was captured from the shore near her village when she was alone. And so an amazing part of our family story and probably many other African-American family story is that they survived the Middle Passage and then they had to survive the breaking in period not just um, physically, but also emotionally, as they had to adapt to becoming an enslaved person where they had been free in Africa. Often when I would get fidgety, especially while she was trying to get me to stand still as she made fancy dresses for my piano recitals, my mother would bring out the box of family memorabilia and pull out items and, and tell me stories. Even before she started telling the stories, she would admonish me with our family credo, which has guided us for some 200 years years, she would say, always remember, you're a Madison. You come from African slaves and a president. By um, repeating the credo at such times, she was telling me how proud she was of our ancestors, both white and black. But she was also letting me know how she was expecting me to behave and the reasons were supported by those family stories that she was getting ready to tell me. They can't tell you the name of the ship their ancestors came over on. They can't tell you the name of the village they were taken from. They probably can't tell you the names of the plantations that their families worked on unless those plantations somehow you know, survived into their oral history because that's how so much of these families' 
uh, stories have been preserved. It's through the it's through the oral tradition that they've passed down from from family member to family member, and that's what that's what Betty's doing. She's the griot. She's the the caretaker of her family's history. According to the griot and griot tradition of my family. Um, after Mandy was sold, she came to James Madison Sr.'s plantation. When Mandy was purchased, uh, probably in, in Fredericksburg, that would have been the, the closest uh, slave market that James Madison Sr. was frequenting, I imagine. Uh, when Mandy was purchased, she would have been put in a wagon, potentially with other people. We don't have any records of when she might have come to the plantation or whether it was as a, by herself or with a, a group of other people. But we certainly know that Madison Sr. was buying uh, enslaved people through the 1740s, 50s, 60s. And also, according to the uh, family oral tradition, Mandy was put in a remote cotton field so that she would be away from most of the activity of this huge tobacco plantation. And it was there that James Madison Sr. first saw her and became attracted to her. And the way the story is told is that he became attracted to her because she could pick cotton so fast. When she arrived at the plantation, think about the culture shock that that would have been for her. Here's like, you know, probably the biggest house in the county is Madison's home. It's this massive brick mansion. Um, much different than anything she's seen. Fields and fields of tobacco and corn, uh, wheat, blacksmith operation, the forges pounding away. How different would that have been from her village in, in Ghana in the Bight of Benin? Uh, there's, there's actually a real similarity in the geography of uh, Virginia and those countries that lie in the Bight and there's a, there's a similarity between the, the forest and between the rolling hills and between the, the red clay soil that exists in both places. But, you know, the difference between her village and this plantation would have been immense. And of course, the biggest difference is that she was totally uh, under the thumb of the person who owned her. And she went from living a life of complete freedom to a life with none. Uh, and she was about to find out how, just how little freedom and how little choice she would have. I don't know exactly what happened. And I don't know whether or not there was assault, any form of violence, or if it was coercion, you know, an effort to um, survive an effort not to be punished in some sort of way, beaten, starved, or, or sold away. She was among the most vulnerable human beings in the world. And he was, James Madison Sr., was among the most powerful human beings in the world, wealthy, well-established Virginia planter. He had power. James Madison Sr.'s attention, <laughs> that the, the attention that he paid to her, uh, led to the birth of a daughter whose name was Corinne. Kareen um, 
initially started picking cotton as a, as a young girl, but later she was chosen to work in the kitchen. So the Madisons had two kitchens underneath their duplex, their historic duplex, but they also had a kitchen outside, which I hear Montpelier is reconstructing, which is fantastic. And kitchens were typically moved outside. Uh, it, ha it started happening in these larger plantation homes um, right about the time where a lot of the enslaved were coming over and replacing the labor of the indentured white laborers. And so when you see the influx and the rise of enslaved Africans coming into the colony and you see a decline of the white indentured servants, you see a separation of space um, within those homes. And the kitchens then began moving outside, not for fear of fire um, or heat. It was because of uh, the need to sort of um, differentiate space and race during this period. Karina, as an enslaved chef at a prominent house in Virginia, would have had different treatment than some of the folks in the field. And of course, this depended on the plantation that you were on. But typically, if you were an enslaved cook working inside of that house, you would have more power than anybody else. You know, you were able to poison the person that enslaved you. And there's been several cases of enslaved cooks poisoning their enslaver, and whether it was intentional or they just left the food out too long is still sort of left to be determined. But that power that they had was something that was very much unique to the enslaved chef. Well, I think um, the connection I have to the enslaved, my enslaved ancestors began to become stronger during the civil rights movement and the, the black power movement. And um, I mean, I think the, the whole country especially you know, the African-American communities throughout the country, became more and more aware of their African roots. You know, we were wearing dashikis and afros and shouting black power. You know, it, was, it was a very unique time. And I think just now we're beginning to become more and more aware of the contributions that the enslaved people made. Many of us are becoming able to take to take pride in our in our ancestors, our enslaved ancestors, and. Um, I think that we're beginning to recognize that, that enslaved people had remarkable inner strength and a sense of hope. Otherwise, they would not have been able to survive. Mandy worked based on um, Betty's um, uh, oral history that she's preserved and has been passed down through the family is, uh, it is in the kitchen. And the kitchen at Montpelier uh, the, the main kitchen throughout the 18th and, and uh, early 19th century into the 1820s at least. And that's the area we, we've done archaeology on over the past, uh, past decade and actually reconstructed the buildings. And in fact, the South Kitchen is what we call it. The South Kitchen today is literally being rebuilt from the ground right now. So historic sites and plantations that interpret slavery have really come a long way. I think that it is incredibly important though, visitors be able to empathize to some kind of degree about what it must have been like. What it, something about what it might have been like to live every day with the knowledge that your 
loved one could be sold and that you would never see them again. I also think that it is important to reconstruct slave dwellings based on really careful study and analysis and archaeological excavation because for a person to be able to walk into a space and feel that space in relationship to, to their own bodies that is so much more impactful than just you know reading about it or and I'm glancing over here at the um, excavation of the kitchen mm -hmm. so I'm actually able to look at where she worked and just see the surrounding area and see the, some of the same things that she once saw. From the moment I told her my family's story, she was excited by it. And they had just discovered this kitchen and she said, you're an outsider, but I'm gonna show you something special. And she took me to see um, the, the, the foundation of the kitchen which was just sort of a rectangle of bricks with a pile of more bricks at one end, which was the cooking hearth. And she slipped open the, the slipped, uh, pulled back some of the blue tarp that was there. And, you know, so I was able to see something real. And what else was real was at that time, there was a groove in the ground that led from the kitchen to the back of the mansion mm -hmm. that had been worn there by generations of slaves walking to and from the kitchen to ser serve the Madisons. And I was able to actually walk in that groove. So I was literally able to walk in my own ancestors' uh, footsteps. It's incredible. Yeah, that was an incredible experience. My friend, I want to call your attention to the eight chapters of the Gospel according to St. Luke and the 22nd verse. It came to pass on the sudden day that he went out into a ship with his disciples and said unto them, let us go over on the other side of the lake. And they lunched forth, but as they sailed, he fell asleep. And there came down a storm, a wind on the lake, and they were filled with water. Um, African Americans from the time of slavery through right now have made major contributions to, to this country. and. James Madison in particular, you know, without the luxuries that slave labor offered him, he would not have been able to go off to the College of New Jersey or whatever they called Princeton at that time and learn about the great political philosophers to formulate the ideas that are the basis for the United States Constitution. And without that constitution, um, this nation would have failed. Well, I imagine her as beautiful, with rich, dark skin, perfect, smooth, beautiful skin. I imagine her body as being kind of sinewy and, and strong. And I imagine her having lots of red beads in her hair before she came to America and ended up with just one bead in her hair that she cherished for the rest of her life. Baptized with the Holy Ghost, my life is pure and clean. For the past 20 years, since May of 2000, I've been the director of archaeology at Montpelier. And pretty much from the day I arrived at Montpelier, been interested in seeing how archaeology can bear witness to the enslaved ancestors of the, 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 the larger Montpelier descendant community. With the material remains, the household broken items, the pottery, the ceramics, sometimes even bits of cufflinks and clothing that were left behind by the ancestors of Montpelier descendants. And with working with the descendant community, like with Betty, all of a sudden these pieces, these fragments of the past 
come to life because to work with descendants and you, you're finding their ancestor remain, remains, their, their the material remains from their households. And in some cases, you're not finding them as archaeologists, you're working with the descendants who are finding them themselves. They're the ones who are holding them in their hands. It is just mind blowing, you know, to, to be, be able to witness that and to, to connect uh, the descendants with their ancestors past. And, and all of a sudden, you're helping to make their ancestors who they don't know necessarily, in some cases, Betty does, but in other cases, they don't know their names and certainly don't have photographs. All of a sudden, you're able to make uh, their ancestors real. I, I'm a little bit ambivalent about my, my pride. Um, Madison was a flawed human being, as we all are, but he, he did great things for the country. So that's, that's where the pride is. So as, as Corrine is growing up on, uh, on the plantation at Montpelier, there are, uh, there are the Madison children who are coming of age at the same time. And so you have these adolescent young men uh, who are on a plantation pretty far from any town of any significant size. There are other plantations around with other plantation owners' children around, but you have a handful of adolescent boys who are gonna to wanna to be adolescent boys. And as the plantation owner, uh, you know, a man in the 18th century is going to encourage his sons to let boys be boys. Um, and of course, you don't want a pregnancy uh, out of wedlock with a plantation owner's daughter. Uh, you certainly don't want your son potentially uh, marrying down, if you will. So you would encourage them to practice, as it were, on the enslaved population, because after all, they were your property and they didn't have any choice in the matter. And the result of, uh, of that behavior was an investment for the Madison family, right? So as, as enslaved women had children who were of mixed parentage, those babies were valuable enslaved property. Uh, and the lighter the skin, the more valuable the enslaved person. As the 19th century wore on and people began to be sold south into the into the deep south, uh, as the as the soil plays out in Virginia and tobacco is no longer quite the cash crop that it was, what you find is Virginia becomes uh, sort of the cradle for the deep south, and all of these enslaved children in Virginia are being sold into Alabama, and Mississippi, and Tennessee, and Arkansas, and eventually to Texas. There are over a million and a half people sold from uh, the Piedmont uh, and the Tidewater of Virginia and the Carolinas and Maryland who uh, either are, are shipped to New Orleans and sold from there or they are chained together in coffles and marched from Richmond or from Charlottesville or from Raleigh or from uh, Hagerstown and they walk to Montgomery, Alabama, they walk to Nashville, they walk to Memphis, chained together by the dozens or even sometimes, uh, you know, multiple dozens of people chained together. And this was not an uncommon sight if you lived in the South, watching hundreds of people walk down the road. 20, 30, 40 year process of that is what is creating the four million people that will eventually be in the South when the Civil War starts. Well, when Jim was sold, he ended up in Tennessee. And we don't actually know what happened 
to Jim, but we do know what happened to his son, Emmanuel. So Emmanuel was owned by Jephth the Billingsley. So in 1848, Jephth brought Emmanuel, his wife, Elizabeth, and his then four sons to Texas. One of Jephthah's sons was Jesse Billingsley. He fought at the Battle of San Jacinto, and he is the one who uh, coined the battle cry, Remember the Alamo. And they were under his ownership at the time that they were emancipated. My great-grandfather and one of his brothers, Giles, stayed with um, Jesse Billingsley as a tenant farmer. They were havers, meaning that they had to give half of whatever they made. Now, I tell you, say, way back in slavery time, I was standing at that the the nigga were free. I we all got every day. And my grandfather became Jesse's right-hand man. I can make it just good to just have, just have uh, six and eight mules to count them going through, and boats on them, uh, count them, count them, then they put the wagon and have boats all on them wagons. I would say one of the most amazing artifacts we've found at Montpelier is a, um, a very small ring, red in color. Uh, it looked like a plastic ring. It was so shiny. You know, it looked like it came out of, you know, out, out, of, out of a uh, little Cracker Jack uh, box or something. And I tapped it on my teeth and it had this, this, this brilliant, sharp feel to it. And I was like, oh my God, this isn't plastic. This is potentially stone. And I immediately took it and I did something that Ben was like, what are you doing? I scratched the window with it and it scratched the glass. And I was like, Ben, this is cryptocrystalline quartz. This is a carnelian bead. This is from Africa. I think after that first generation comes over on the, on the slave ships from Africa, they are, they are so, uh, their their culture their they they've lost so much of their culture they weren't able to bring any or very few physical remnants of their culture with them that ring you know is a tiny is a tiny piece of their culture that they may have been able to secrete away on the on the ship and so the the culture that they can bring with them is all stuff that they know in their head so it's recipes it's it's music it's ways of praying it's uh, you know the gods that they bring with them and that first generation though gets so um so their their culture gets so trodden out of them that you don't really see that culture reassert itself until the second or third generation they're not allowed to practice their culture in most instances funerals might be might be an exception to that but that the the gods and the religion and the the, the way they pray and the music you start to see that reassert itself in a Americanized way. And by that, I don't mean anything to do with the Stars and Stripes, but you know, in a way that's unique, unique to the enslaved population of North America. Uh, and as they begin to be sold South and their families are, are broken up and they're removed further from their parents or their grandparents or people who were in the same villages that they were, um, it becomes it becomes even more fractured and they hold on to little bits and pieces of it that you see sort of coming reasserting itself in a new way in this culture in the south uh, and you know probably the the place you see that the most is in is in the church services that they begin to conduct and the uh, you know the the AME church in the south so after the Civil War, the name was no longer needed as a tool to find torn away loved ones. And now the name could be a source of, of pride. 
So Jim's son, Emmanuel, my great-great-grandfather, taught his children to be proud that their name had belonged to a president and to make the most of the leg that legacy now that they had a chance. So he added to the credo, and it became, always remember, you're a Madison. You come from a president. And that was the credo for the next two generations until my grandfather, my beloved Gramps, who was born free. Um, he was Emmanuel's grandson. He was proud that his father and grandfather and other enslaved uh, ancestors had overcome enslavement. So Gramps added two important words, African slaves. So the credo became, always remember, you're a Madison. You come from African slaves and a president. So for the last 100 years, the credo has reminded us that we're not just descendants of a president, we're descendants of enslaved people too. You know, while we don't have uh, marked graves of the ancestors at Montpelier, like with tombstones with names and dates, we have found the ancestral cemetery of the, the enslaved Americans who lived, worked, and died at Montpelier. And we have found it all in, in one, one spot. It's one area that for years, our earlier archaeologists had found these depressions in the ground. And originally it was thought there was maybe 38 to 45 graves in this one area, but we've recently done ground penetrating radar. And what we discovered is there are hundreds of graves in this location. And what it makes us realize it's this spot that's not too, just down the hill from the main house is probably where any member of the enslaved community during the Madison era who passed away was buried there. When enslaved individuals died, somewhat paradoxically, that was one of the moments where the enslaved community had the most control over their lives. So through death, they controlled their day, that ceremony, that ritual. And enslaved people didn't always have control over their daily rituals. But with funerals, most slave owners, not all, but most, did not interfere with mortuary rituals, as far as we can tell. So for an enslaved individual, when they died, whoever their close family were, hopefully were at hand, and I say hopefully because in some cases, the enslaved families had been separated over distance from sales, but your closest relatives would come to care for the body, undress the body, clean the body. This was work that was often done by women and lay the body out. Especially in the South, you wanted to bury the body as soon as possible. Very often then that evening, you would move to bury the body but the funeral itself might occur days, weeks, months later when people from different plantations and other enslaved communities were able to get word of the death and were able to travel to that plantation. And as you can imagine, all of the events that I'm saying as if enslaved people had control of their daily lives, the reason why it worked is because these funerals, these memorials, these commemorative events were often held at night and very often at midnight, in fact when enslaved people, for the most part, were not in the fields working or not in the houses working and had some control over their own lives. I 
as I mentioned before, enslaved people were remarkable uh, human beings who had inner strength and sense of balance and a sense of hope, and they had many talents and they contributed mightily to this country. But I think it's important for us to remember today that when slaves died, they didn't take those qualities to the grave with them. They passed them on to their descendants, including those of us alive today. So including me, including my daughter, Nicole, including my two grandchildren, Justice! one of whom is named Madison. We don't get it! Shut it down! If you don't get it! Shut it down! And so it would be 10 generations for Madison and Peter. But, but those qualities are, are still with them. And those qualities are still with other um, African Americans and, and the generations to come. As long as we remember our enslaved ancestors. And, and really that's why the, the Griot Griot tradition is so important. And another thing that I remember on the plantation that we hadn't mentioned before was the churn song. Little Emma, the baby's nurse, after the baby was tucked in bed, was often called in the kitchen to do the churning. And this is a song that she sang to the milk. Come, butter, come, mister standing at the gate, waiting for the butter cake to come, butter, come. Come, butter, come, mister's a waiting. Come, butter, come, mister's a waiting. Come, butter, come, the missus a waiting. Come, butter, come, the missus a waiting. Missus a waiting for the butter cake to come, butter, come. Come, butter, come, missus a waiting. Missus a waiting for the butter cake to come, butter, come, missus a waiting. Come, butter, come, the missus a waiting. And this chant would go on through until the churning was finished and the rich golden butter would come into a solid cake on the top of the mill. That was an absolutely magnificent documentary, Eduardo. I just want you to know, not only did you tell the story in that documentary, but you captured the emotion that was going on throughout the story that was being told. Can, can you tell us, of all the things that you could be doing, why did you decide to do this documentary? There's two reasons why the documentary will fall into my target. <laughs> Um, and one is, it's a story that has not been told. And then it must be a story that has to be told. That's when they get my, my unconditional commitment. And in both, uh, the answer to both questions was yes and yes. It was a story that wasn't told because it's from a very peculiar uh, point of view. Um, and that needs to be told, yes, because uh, the, I believe that the number of stories that need still to be told to have a more complete um, story of the African-American experience uh, is infinite. You know, one of the, as I look at that African-American experience and, and that your ability to capture it within your documentary, I mean, the uh, the pictures of the and the songs. How did you find those, and and how did they come to you? Well, um, I in my past reincarnation as a child, I grew up with uh, in in between the legs of my father and his friends who run a, a recording studio, uh, who had a um, very early arrangement with folkways and the Smithsonian. 
Uh, so I grew up with Pitsier music and Pitsier and, and the like. And, um, and a lot of recordings, field recordings that my father and his friends will, will conduct. So I immediately, okay, that is one side. On the other side is that music recently published is extremely expensive. So this is a win-win situation. I look for copyright free and where I have to only pay for the license of this music. And this is a path that always leads me to, to forgotten archives. <laughs> so in this case, what you hear is the voices of former uh, enslaved men and women that you heard especially the women singing at the end, um, which were field recordings captured in, 19, in the early 1930s, 1930, 1932. And they are with the Library of Congress and the Smithsonian. They're the gatekeepers. You know, one of the things that I noticed about the documentary is that you did an excellent job of mixing the past with the present and, and combining them. And at the end of that documentary, I saw that young woman looked like she was in a protest. She said, we don't get it. She said, but you don't get it. What did you mean by having that in the documentary? Because I, I still think I don't get it. And it's a reminder to myself. And I like to be, I like to expose uh, consciously my, my limitations. Um, and when I saw that black woman, uh, beautiful black woman, young uh, uh, veteran of the United States uh, Armed Forces who has just come back from Afghanistan, I believe, or just a couple years ago, who had somewhat, again, contributed like Betty's ancestors, to build this country, the country where I live in, my children are growing up, and um, and she's really pissed off, and she's in the Black Lives Matter uh, uh, square right there in in Washington D.C. And when she sees the camera, she's saying, "We don't get it," and then turns around and looks at the lens and says, "You don't get it." And I go, "You're right. I'm not. I'm trying, but I'm trying. But I'm trying." Well, I thought you did a great job of getting it. We, we're going to come back to you in just a moment, Eduardo. I want to invite the audience to ask the questions or to write your questions in the question and answer box on the screen. And we'll project those and, and ask our esteemed panelists. But for the moment, we're going to come back to Betty in just a moment. But we're going to go talk to Kristen. So Kristen, you know, you have been at, at Montpelier there for two decades, it said and you have been teaching people and you've been finding interesting facts. So tell us about the most interesting fact or item that you have found during your 20 years at Montpelier. Hmm. Well, geez, uh, okay. Yeah, I started at Montpelier in, in 2000 when it was still the, the DuPont house that um, Betty described a little bit in her book when she first went there for the first time. I probably started uh, I don't know, five or six years after Betty first visited. And by the time I left in 20, oh God, what year was it? 2019. <laughs> uh, you know, we had, we had completely, we had completely restored the house to the way it looked in, in the Madison era. And uh, we had done all the archeology span in the South Yard and we had rebuilt the South Yard uh, quarters and we had rebuilt uh, other quarters out in the, landscape. So it was a, it was an incredibly different place. We've done so much uh, in those 20 years to better tell the story of the African American community that lived at Montpelier uh, for all those years. And I think, I mean, I can tell you about the most interesting object that, you know, was discovered. I didn't discover it. You know, the, you know Matt was talking about that carnelian ring, which I just think has like just such an awesome, the potential for such an awesome story behind it. Cause that ring 
you know, I think of that as the the movie The Red Violin, if you ever saw that, you know, that ring could have started, you know, coming out of the ground in India, and then it came across the Indian Ocean to East Africa, and then it went across the continent of Africa through the trans-African trade and wound up with somebody in West Africa, and then made it through the Middle Passage to Virginia, you know, I mean, it's an incredible story. But I think for me, the, the most interesting, not a discovery, but just the most interesting and most important thing that I learned at Montpelier or that I found at Montpelier were the relationships that I built with people like Betty uh, and the rest of the, uh, of the descendant community who became involved at Montpelier in the time that I was there. The work that we did uh, with, the, with the descendant community uh, really got off the ground in 2005. I mean, it started earlier than that, but it really um, got big in 2005, 2007, and just grew and grew and grew until um, we opened the Mere Distinction of Color exhibition in 2017, which was a huge exhibition about the African-American experience at Montpelier, told almost entirely through the perspective of the of the people who were enslaved there, rather than through the perspective of the of the enslavers, which is the typical uh, experience that you get as a museum goer. So, meeting Betty uh, and meeting other people like Iris and Madeline and Patrice and God, the list goes on and on and on. Um, uh, meeting the descendants was really the most uh, impactful thing for my career, I think, and, and the most important part of my work. So when you started working there, Kristen, was it was it your goal to try to um, match descendants with their uh, with their pre with their relatives who'd been there many many years before? Was that what you were thinking about when you first walked through those doors? No, no. I you know I took that I took the job at Montpelier fresh out of graduate school, trying to get off of a construction site, you know, and I couldn't find a job teaching high school history, which is what I wanted to do. And they gave me a job, uh, you know, talking to little kids at the museum about James Madison and and the plantation and the enslaved community. And I figured I would keep that job for six months. And look, it. it lasted 20 years and it just grew and grew and grew and grew. Um, and it was a fantastic experience. And, and you know, really the, the majority, from, from the point of view of the staff at Montpelier, the majority of credit for the work that we did with the descendant community really belongs to Matt Reeves, who you saw in the film. Matt's the director of archeology span there. He and I started within about a week of each other uh, in the year 2000 uh, when we came to Montpelier. And, Matt had done a lot of his uh, field work for his PhD in Jamaica, where he was really embedded in the, uh, in the mountain communities uh, where he was digging. And he learned so much about the history of what was happening in those uh, plantations 300 years ago from the people who still lived in those mountains, you know? And he realized that, that well, I mean, it just, he, he was the one who would point out to everybody that the African-American communities that are still living in and around Montpelier are the people who are descended from the people who worked there 200 years ago. And they're the people who know, you know, the land and know the history and have been on the land for that whole time. Uh, and he was really insistent right from the very beginning that we involve the descendant community uh, in ways that are not typically done at museums because typically at museums, you, you know, you, what you see is people get involved with the descendant staff, gets involved with the descendant community, either as um, a way to glean historical information. We want to know, you know, where, you know, who are you related to, that kind of thing, and, and what do you know, and then we're going to leave you alone and not talk to you anymore. Or um, they're studied as some kind of anthropog anthropological anomaly. Right, says microcosm of people, and what do you, you know, what can we, you know, what can we find out about you scientifically? Um, but rarely do museums approach uh, the descendant community as stakeholders or as potential stakeholders, and want to involve them in the museum, in the decision-making process, in the interpretive process, in the storytelling process. And I think um, that's what was so important, uh, and what Montpelier has really excelled at over the last two decades. 
Well, I'm just, uh, I'm just feel amazed at the way in which you and Eduardo have come together to tell this story. But now, Kristen, don't go away. We're going to talk to Betty for just a moment yeah. as we still invite our audience to put their questions in the question and answer box because we are going to get to your questions tonight, every single one of them. So Betty, you know, the biggest question that, that I think I'm seeing uh, arising is why did it take you 30 years to write this book? Tell us about that. Well, there are a number of reasons. For one thing, when my mother handed over the box of memorabilia to me, she was just handing over a treasure, you know, just full of riches. And she also told me to write a book. So I had so much to work with. I wasn't quite sure what would be the best way to present my family story. So I, I wrote um, a straightforward family history. I wrote a novel and I ended up with a memoir. So I wrote two other books, two other complete books before the um, other Madisons, the lost history of a president's Black family and, and just the writing took a while. And at the same time, I was working full time as a pediatrician in the Boston area. And the research took a long time. I, I traveled to Portugal and Africa and you know around the country. And, and those, those, those trips just, you know, they were just time consuming and figuring out how to best use what I learned in those trips uh, took a bit of time. And then um, I ran into obstacles during the research. You know, records had been burned. Uh, you know, people wouldn't give me information. Not to people at Montpelier, though. I must be sure to say that people, the staff at Montpelier have always um, been very helpful. And then the other thing was that I had to grow as a person in order to deal with some of the really um, serious issues that are part of my family's history. Well, Betty, I want you to know, let me, let me share with you one of the questions that has been raised by, by our, a member of our audience. And she says, Betty, you've had a long career as a physician um, and what trepidation did you have at approaching a significant work as a writer? Because you were already a very a well-known, wonderful physician. And what about moving into the field of writing? Did you have mentors and readers that gave you advice along the way about being published? And, and what was that advice that was given to yeah, you? Yeah, I mean, that was another thing <laughs> that led to it taking um, 20 years, 30 years. You know, I always loved to write, but I did it mostly for my enjoyment. I didn't write for others to read it. And so I had, you know, I took a lot of classes. I was in a lot of writing groups. Um, and, you know, there was a lot of trial and error. I was sort of learning as I was, as I was writing. And um, this is really not part of the question, but I have to say, you know, getting a book published takes a long time. The uh, publication, the world of publication is really tough to, to navigate. So you have to get an agent, which is difficult. You have to get a publisher, which is difficult. But, you know, the writing really was a work of love. I, I really, you know, enjoyed the, the process. Well, I think, well, we've enjoyed the reading of your book. So I just want to say that. Well, what, another question that was uh, brought forth was, you know, you talked a lot and, and you mentioned a lot about this box in the book. And so one of our, the members of our audience wants to know what was in that box, Betty? So tell us about it. Oh, you know, all, all sorts of things because each generation of griots or Griots adds to the box. So it grows and grows. 
So they're going back to my um, great grandfather. There were land deeds. He was able to purchase land uh, shortly after he was emancipated. So, and then he bought, I, I can't remember, um, 1874, he bought uh, 96 acres. And then a year later, he turned it over and bought. 100, 190 acres, I'm, I'm not sure, but roughly that. And so, you know, owning something was so, such a point of pride, especially owning land. And so my, my great grandfather put those in, it was a Bible at that time, he put them in the Bible. And um, let's see, what, there's the 1860 slave census, there's more my favorites are letters that my grandfather wrote to me when I was a baby. One welcoming me, welcoming me into the world. Another actually written to my parents about me, like why didn't they put shoes on my feet? Because my feet, if they didn't, my feet were gonna get big and don't you know that boys don't like girls with big feet? You know, there's just these, <laughs> wonderful treasures in there, you know, samples of one of my great uh, aunt sewing, um, lots and lots of photographs, newspaper clippings, personal letters. Yes. Well, that sounds really interesting, Betty. I, I just want you to know that I can relate to that story about make sure you put your shoes on so that your feet don't grow because my grandmother used to say that to me all the time. So I, I'm glad that was in the box. So do you, um, do you encourage people to create maybe not a box, but some sort of memorabilia of the history of their family so that, so that it is captured in some way? So tell us what you're thinking. Yes. Well, first I encourage them to speak to their elders and just ask them for whatever information they can remember about the men and women who came before them. It can be the tiniest thing because, you know, it, it's, it's family histories are getting lost. And so then I hope people will write those down. And I encourage people to also, especially the kids, to go into the attics and the basements and the backs of the closets and search for family treasures and put them, I, I think a box is the best thing. It could be a drawer, it could be anything where you can really accumulate things in, in one place. And for each generation, there should be a person who's responsible for collecting the stories and adding to the box then passing on the box and that responsibility to the next generation. So Betty, I'm, I have one more question to ask you uh, from the audience and then we're gonna ask Kristen and Eduardo to come back. But one of the questions that was raised was if you had the opportunity to speak to Mandy today, what would you say to her? What conversation would you want to have with Mandy? Oh, what a good question. Interesting question. Um, you know, is do I represent her well? Um, you know, did, did I do right by the legacy that she left for us? You know, it, is she proud of me? Is she proud of the way I raised my daughter? Does she like the book? <laughs> That would be good. That would be good. Let, let's bring Eduardo and Kristen back onto the, uh, uh, into our conversation. And uh, let's just sort of talk with you. Kristen, where are you? There you go. So yes, Kristen, you were going to say something. I did. I just wanted to respond to something that Betty was saying about, um, you know, what people can do today. And, you know, it, it, there's a tendency um, amongst historians and older folks that, you know, we always look at the younger people and it's up to them to, uh, to gather this information. But I would, you know, 
I, I would suggest that younger people are not really well cut out for that. And it's not something that often interests them. And for the older generations to remember that and to take the responsibility to one, record that information yourself, even if your grandkids aren't interested in it, because one day they will be. Uh, and two, um, is to is to record and and um, relate as much of the truth as you can, because a lot of the time family histories like to um, gloss over the more painful parts, uh, and we try to protect our kids or our grandkids from learning of the the worst parts of of history, and that that's not helpful. Right, because if we if we continue to do that, then uh, then we continue to repeat those mistakes. So I, I think be as you know as brutally honest with whoever is recording your history as you can, so that it, it gets it gets remembered correctly. Wow. Well, you know, one of the things that um, has also arisen, Eduardo and Kristen, neither of you are black, and here's this black woman who's coming to tell the story or to learn the story of a family. What was that like having to talk about the, the beatings, the rapes, the, um, the uncomfortable parts of the history that you had to uncover and to discuss that with Betty? And Betty, what was it like with you to discuss it with these two men uh, who don't have necessarily the same background and culture that you do? Tell us what that was like for the three of you. Who starts? Should I start? Yes, you should start, Eduardo. We'd like to hear from you. I think there is, um, I think that the, the injustices committed by mankind upon mankind is, is, uh, is it happens everywhere. It's, it's, I was I was familiar with my own experience. I come from Argentina. There was a dictatorship. It was a, a military coup, a Nazi party in power. Uh, I I ended up in 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 a camp for a few weeks uh, before we were all expelled from the country. And tomorrow is anniversary actually of that military coup, March twenty fourth, nineteen seventy six, where thirty thousand people were executed, amongst them many of my classmates. So. To me, it's not a foreign concept. I was not born in a in a bed of flowers. Um, I think that my experience is completely different, although it happened to me and to my family and to my friends. Um, but I don't think that, that you have to go through that in order to understand the complexity of somebody else's uh, uh, journey. Um, and it's happening today in Africa, in Palestine, in, in Europe, and uh, in Central America um, with the Rohingyans in, 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 in Southeast Asia, um, with the Chinese constructing extermination camps to get rid of the Muslims. So, this is the way that work works. I don't think that we're looking back as much as we look inside to find the horrors of, of civilization. Well, I can uh, respond too. I, I think, you know, from my perspective as a, as a historian and as a person whose um, job it was to uh, interpret uh, the history of Montpelier and to train other interpreters on, on what to interpret and how to interpret. Um, I, I, we were always very, <clears throat> we always wanted to be very um, straight up with our audiences about, about the realities of slavery. And, um, and this was certainly one of them. And there's a, there's a question in the chat right now that kind of uh, goes along with this, which is um, referring to the, the comments that I made about the Madison young men being um, uh, encouraged to access the, um, the slave women um, because they were their property. And, you know, for, for, for a long time, historians 
couldn't put their finger on any kind of hard evidence to substantiate this. But DNA studies uh, have really changed that, uh, that ability. And through 23andMe, there's been um, all this DNA collected uh, and they started, um, started analyzing and reporting on, on some of these studies last summer. And what they're finding is that there is, I think more than anybody imagined, an inordinate amount of white male parentage in the African-American community going back into the you know, 1600s, 1700s, 1800s. Um, and it, it gets um, more frequent the farther south you go. So I think it's three, um, uh, it, you're three times more likely to have a Europe, European father as an enslaved child in British North America. And you are 25 times more likely to have a European father if you're an enslaved child in South America. So you think about how, you know, the institution of slavery sp spread all through the Atlantic world and how, you know, going down into Brazil, uh, it's just that that trait just got worse and worse. I, I read about something recently that I hadn't heard about before where, um, and I cannot recall the, the country that was promoting this, but they were actually bringing European men over to some country in Central America or the Caribbean to purposefully to um, impregnate enslaved women to change the dichotomy of the, of the, of the race, to, to purposefully lighten the skin color. Um, so this is a, this is, it's a hard subject to talk about. It's not a comfortable subject to talk about, but it is a subject that we wanted to talk about at Montpelier. And, you know, one of the things that we, we did through, um, through the exhibition that we opened in 2017 was we really tried to hit people in the gut more than in the head with that exhibition. And we tried to make it less of an academic exercise and more of an emotional exercise and we we did that by by um by evoking empathy in people right and no none of us are ever going to know what it feels like to get behind a plow and go plow 40 acres right but we can imagine um we're all somebody's child we may be somebody's parent we may be somebody's grandparent and we can imagine what it would feel like to have our family members taken away from us right and we can imagine how helpless it would make us feel as, as men if our women were being raped by someone else and we had no recourse to stop that. And we can imagine, uh, you know, I can't, but you know, if you're a woman, you can imagine what it might be like to be helpless in a situation like that when the person who's raping you has the ability to sell your child if you say no, you know? Uh, and so we tried to, we tried to, relate those feelings and those stories to our visitors because it was a way to, to have people empathize with the, with the enslaved community and really, um, you, know, you know, like Eduardo was saying earlier, I'm trying to understand. Well, that's a way we can help visitors try to understand. Well, thank you both. Betty, are we gonna round out this discussion with a question to you specifically in this area? How do you confront the reality that, that some of your ancestors oppressed others and caused harm to others in the manner in which you've been able to discover? What's that like, Betty? Well, not only did they oppress them, they owned them and took um, physical advantage of some of, of some of them. And you know, I, I, I have a, a good amount of anger of, about that and a lack of understanding. I mean, it's just kind of hard for me to understand how anyone can justify owning another human being and, you know, maybe treating them worse than they did their animals. And so, uh, for, well, for, for James Madison uh, Jr., I, I do have 
some mixed feelings, not about uh, his owning, pe owning people because um, I, I just cannot comprehend anybody being able to do that. But because he, you know, he he did have a, a great mind and he did contribute so contribute so much um, to this country. But it, it's it's not balanced. I am more angry with him than I am proud of what he accomplished. Well, I just want to say, leaving this on a high note that you've accomplished a lot in writing this best-selling book with these two amazing men beside you providing some context for other information that you might not otherwise have had. And then to see it rise visually in a documentary is exceptionally awesome. So we wanna thank our panelists tonight, uh, the, the wonderful, the awesome Dr. Betty Pierce herself who wrote this best-selling uh, novel, and then Eduardo Montez Bradley, who brought um, all the emotion into a visualization. And then there is Kristen Coates, who said, I'm going to tell you the story so that you can produce it. So it's been absolutely wonderful having you all here tonight. And remember to our audience, the book is The Other Madisons, The Lost History of a President's Black Family, and you can get it today. So thank you. Amara, is there anything else that you want to say to us before we say good night? I don't think so. You all were perfect. Thank you all. We'll see you in the living room again soon. All right. Good night, everybody. Thanks for having us. Thank you.